Good morning, everyone. <laughs> My name is Megan Camp, and I'm the chair of the board of the Vermont Council on Rural Development. And I am very pleased to welcome you. We're still coming in through the door to our second annual Community Leadership Summit. This day is designed, and we're all going to be able to help create it, to advance democracy and local leadership in creating a better future for all Vermonters. And I want to thank you all for coming here today and bringing your leadership to the shared effort and to all of our important work together. We're very grateful to be here at Vermont Technical College and very happy that they're hosting us again. And to start our day together, it's my pleasure to introduce the president of Vermont Technical College, Pat Moulton. Thank you so much, Meg, and welcome to Vermont Tech up here on the hill in Randolph Center where the weather is always like this, <laughs> especially in February. So, um, no, we're very pleased to have you here at Vermont Tech for the second annual leadership conference. And as uh, Paul Costello knows, and many of you in the audience know, Randolph has been going through somewhat of a transformation in the last few well, last year plus when we've engaged in the VCRD's um, Climate Economy Model Communities Project. And it's due to the work of the local leaders who have stepped up that are making good things happen in this community. Things that would not otherwise have happened without that local leadership. And as today's agenda for the, uh, states, quote, in democracy, all citizens are called upon to lead. Local leadership is the key ingredient in building unity, setting direction, and achieving progress. Local leaders make it happen. There are no truer words, and you are the ones who are and will make it happen in your community. And Paul asked me to talk a little bit about what I think leadership is, given some of the work I've done in my career in economic development and now in higher ed. And I find that a little daunting task because leaders come in all many shapes and sizes, and how I perceive a good leader may be very different than what others and what you may think of as a good leader, but you know, I think that's fine because there really is no one mold for a good leader. But in my opinion, a good leader is motivated to make things better, according to their definition of better. And they are driven by that. And their definition of better may vary, may not agree with your definition of better, but it what's vote, it's what motivates a good leader, in my opinion. And a good leader is willing to listen, a lot and consider what they are hearing, amend, alter, change certain parts of their vision to meet the common ground and the community needs. That leader may hang on to their goals, but, recognize a good, but recognizes a good leader does not dictate and considers all the views and all the viewpoints. And then that leader acts, makes a decision, doesn't look back, assesses their decision and how progress is being made, adjusts when needed, and then continues. A good leader is not afraid to admit his or her mistakes, owns the good decisions, and owns the bad decisions, but ultimately is willing to take the criticism and the kudos, and rarely are there many kudos. So prepare yourself for that. Leaders in our communities are key to moving communities forward. We all live in communities that are impacted by our local leaders. Be they geographic community or other community, we feel the impacts of our local leaders so much faster because they are local and they're doing the work that affects us immediately. The work of great leaders like we have in Senator Leahy are a few steps removed in Washington, but we feel those impacts quickly as well. And we're blessed to have good leaders like you, Senator. Thank you very much. So the work we are doing, the work you are doing in communities is so critical, and it would not happen without you. And this brings me to a poem my father, Al Moulton, a longtime government and economic development official here in Vermont, wrote the year I was born. Okay, so it's got a couple years on it. Yes, I know I'm only 25, but anyway. But um, he was a relatively young leader then. And I think the sentiment remains relevant today, despite what my father's journalism background would tell him about the grammar. But he wrote it after hearing too much of they need to do something. 
they're not getting it done. When are they going to act? Things of that nature. So he wrote the following. Well, who is they? Why, they is we. We are the ones who can build our town, and we are the ones who can let it down. We are the ones who can make it grow, or we are the ones who can let it go. It is up to us if our town is going to boom, or we can sit back and seal its doom. Who is they? Well, I'll tell you. We is they, and they is you. You have taken the step by being here today, so thank you for the leadership you provide already in your communities and the leadership you will be providing. Thanks for stepping up because you are so sorely needed. Have a great day. Thank you, Pat, for your inspiring words. Now I have the honor of introducing Senator Patrick Leahy. And there probably isn't an issue or an activity in Vermont or even around the nation or in the world that the senator hasn't touched. From campaigning against landmines to protecting democratic institutions and the health of our environment. He's a champion for Vermont agriculture, for agriculture, child nutrition, and a driving force behind Vermont's leadership in the National Farm to School movement. Here in Vermont, his support is also wide-ranging from community development and affordable housing to providing resources to combat the opioid problem to advancing village revitalization. And beyond this long list of legislative action, Senator Patrick Leahy has modeled civility and statementship in the nation and for the nation. Senator Leahy's integrity and his passion for public service is an inspiration for all of us. And he and Marcel are one of the reasons that we can feel proud to be Vermonters. It's my great honor to introduce America's senior senator, but in Vermont, our beloved Senator Pat Leahy. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Usually, Marcel and I are dressed a lot less uh, formally, walking with you and your husband down to Shelburne Farms and, and enjoying it and having our, now our grandkids run around there and, and enjoy it. But thank you for the introduction. And thank you for uh, both you and your husband for holding on to those Vermont values. And Pat, Pat Moulton, we've been here many times together. Your, your father's uh, poem, of course, I knew your dad quite well, and, uh, and I can just hear him saying that poem. I could quote some other things he said, but it maybe they were probably a little bit too frank. Uh, but, he, but he's right, it's up to us. And I think I was talking with Paul Costello on the way in, when I think of the Vermont Council on Rural Development is doing, organizing this, I am so happy, and I'm glad to see <clears throat> this is your second one, and it worked the first time. It's old friends from all over the state here. And as Vermonters, we do have a proud history of leadership and creativity. We we faced um, challenges. We've overcome them. I, remember when we were hit with Hurricane Irene and going around the state the day after the rain stopped and going into towns that had been devastated and people were already out rebuilding. Uh, you're here in this room because you've been identified as leaders. Maybe you've acknowledged that trait within yourself and for you taking the lead may come naturally. Others may have been encouraged to be here today those who recognize a, a skill that hasn't yet been tapped. But whether you're a veteran of committees or boards or elective office or someone new to the fold, 
This native Vermonter wants to thank you for your willingness to serve Vermont. And look at some of the reports, and some say there's five types of leadership, there's some say six or seven, or maybe they're visionary, charismatic, whatever. Uh, don't try to put it into numbers. Be a leader and make it work. It's really not the number of different kinds of leaderships. It's knowing there's different situations calling for different approaches. You look at the opportunity shared and presented. And you go with that, you bring people together. And I think that's what's important, especially in a little state like ours. You have to recognize strengths and weaknesses, and then you have to let individuals shine as a member of the team. Not everybody has the same skill set. Everybody has some. Find out what they are and do it, but that means you have to have confidence in yourself and you have to trust those surrounding you. I'm blessed with what I think is the finest Senate staff possible, both here in Vermont, led by John Tracy, who's here, and in Washington by J.P. Dow, uh, University of Vermont graduate. And I look at these people, I, I, I joke that <laughs> Kelsey knows what's coming next, but I joke that uh, I'm merely a constitutional impediment to the staff of it all. <laughs> But we just had a group of our appropriation staff up here in Vermont meeting with leaders in Vermont, finding out what some of the needs are. And they also um, found the weather is different in Vermont than, than the 95 degree weather we've had for a month in, in Washington. But let's, let's take just one of the needs and challenges. We're facing an opioid epidemic here. Uh, I remember when I was Chittenden County State's Attorney, because I had drug problems, there's nothing like we face today. And what I hear when Marcel and I are in the grocery store and people come over and say, can we speak to you privately? And it's about a family member. Uh, or maybe them, an opioid problem. And I know what this is doing to families and individuals and communities. I held a series of hearings when I was chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee throughout Vermont. We asked for ideas, we asked for possible solutions, because I wanted those solutions to bring them back, not as a big urban solution, but what works in a state like ours. And from what I learned from that, last week we were able to announce that the University of Vermont and the University of Vermont Medical Center been awarded a $6.6 .6 million grant for a center on rural addiction. I wrote that law and got that money because I knew they could reach out and set an example for the rest of the country. It's going to be one of only three in the country, but it's going to work on the hub and spoke method we have here. And it is important to me that this center be located in Vermont. If it works as I think it will, uh, then it can be used throughout the rest of the country, the model can. And I pointed out to my fellow members, fellow senators in the Appropriations Committee, this is not a partisan thing. Governor Peter Shuttle, a Democrat, Governor Phil Scott, a Republican, have both publicly acknowledged the challenge of substance abuse and needs to address it. And I applaud Governor Scott for that. And I applaud former Governor Shumlin for doing that. Because when you think about it, it's not political, it's the communities we love, the people we know here in Washington. And, uh, and or in Washington and in Vermont, we have to speak up for them. I will not forget the people who approach us the grocery store coming out of church. Even the other day I was pumping gas in the car. These tales, and that's why I love, other than the fact that it's really nice being home uh, <laughs> and uh, watching grandkids run across the, the lawn in our home in, in Middlesex yesterday. And, 
But I think about, for, uh, let, let me tell you another story. Um, I sat around a Vermont farm family's kitchen table, and they were talking to me about organic farming. This was years ago. I didn't know that much about organic farming, so I came back and talked to them, talked to some of the others. And I thought, you know, we ought to be able to do this nationwide. The then chairman of the Senate Agriculture Committee, God rest his soul, <clears throat> had a different philosophy than I did. He said, this is a crunchy granola thing. We're not going to do it. And he would only listen to big agriculture. I became chairman. And I wrote it into the 1990 Farm Bill with the help of a Republican senator, Dick Luger. You know that crunchy granola idea that came from that kitchen table in Vermont is now a $50 billion industry as of last year. Uh, I was telling that story in, uh, in Washington and I said what somebody said to me, they said, well, Jesus, crawl. And the people in Washington looked at me, what is Jesus Crow? Uh, oh, uh, you know. But um, a whole lot of leaders in the organic farm field. Oh, we could lay down the groundwork, but it took the leaders to do it. So leadership comes in many shapes and styles. Being here today, you're leading. And I applaud you for doing this. You make me proud to be a Vermonter knowing that you're going to be the leaders in our state. Now look at, you go across all, all ages here. That's good. We need it. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Senator Leahy, for all you stand for. You make us proud for your statesmanship, for your integrity, for your leadership for rural America. The National Rural Development Partnership gave Senator Leahy their Champion of Rural America Award several years ago. Um, we're deeply proud to have you as our Senator, and thank you so much for everything you do for us as a council and for all the communities we serve. So thank you, Senator. Could we get a show of hands? How many people were here in Castleton last year at the summit? About a third or a quarter of you. Great to have so many new folks. I want to just give you a quick picture of VCRD and our purposes and practice for the course of the day today. VCRD is charged by the Federal Farm Bill. Our national leader has been Senator Leahy in working to build state rural development councils across the nation. We're a nonpartisan group designed to bring people together uh, we do so community to community. We've worked with about 140 towns intensively and at the state level where we look, how do we add things up for the future of our working landscape, for energy development in Vermont, for the creative economy, for how we approach climate change in a positive way that benefits our communities and advances our economy. Um, we have a model community visit that we've taken to towns all across the state. We say to communities, democracy is an experiment. It's not done that those who engage, prioritize, and unite become collective spear points of activity that drive their communities forward and change Vermont. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. When you're organized and you know where you're going and your community is with you, resources follow. Don't wait for Washington, D.C., and don't wait for Montpelier, Vermont, to set the course for your community. They can't do it. They can't lead for you. They can't set direction. But if you line up, those resources will follow you. It's all about local leadership. In democracy, there's not one person appointed to be the leader for your community. We're all responsible. It's part of our, of our blood to stand for things, to stand up for what we believe in, to drive our communities forward. It's part of what we are about. Power follows those who step up and bring people together in collective action. 
resources follow. We see this power every day in the communities we work with. And I see it right here in this room, that this is a room dedicated to the progress of Vermont. We're bigger than our individual purposes. We have a, a, a direction that we help set every day. And it's an incredible honor to be here with all of you. At Hazen Middle School last year, my granddaughter, Georgia, Georgia, stand up for just a second. <laughs> Her class had this idea of they had a geography lesson on North Africa. And afterwards, a circle of girls got together and said, what could we do about this? They looked online, they gathered information, and they found a place that they could invest in a well. And they raised money together by doing a walkathon. They put together $5,000 in Hardwick, Vermont to support a, a well in North Africa. Our world is small, and you don't need permission to lead. Could we have a round of applause? It's just, a, it's just a little story, really, isn't it? Because this is what happens every day. This is what people do all the time. This is natural to us. Animosity, hatred, you know, that's, that's not what we are as a democracy. We stand together. We stand up for good things, and we make them happen every day with hard work. Uh, last year's summit, we heard powerful collective ideas from over 500 people. We gathered those principles together. We published an interim report that many people got, and if you haven't seen it, it's online. We built a symposium for organizations that are looking at the future of leadership in Vermont, some of our great partners, some of our outreach partners. The symposium came up with three key findings about leadership for the future. And the first, it's not a big surprise, it's about we have to do more to expand youth leadership, to support young people who are stepping up, to support the next generation, support civility and their understanding of their role in, in a democratic society. We depend on them. We need to systematically advance vision funding and creative policies and programs to provide skill opportunities for young people today to lead the future of Vermont. The second one is we need to build diverse and inclusive leadership we need to open Vermont up to everyone. We need to expand the diversity of leadership, and by doing so, we expand the idea of Vermont, what it means to be a Vermonter. It's not just sixth generation farmers. It's someone who moves here from, from away and wants to be part of our community and wants to, to have an impact for good. We need to welcome that, and that's the seed for creativity to powerfully answer Vermont's demographic and economic challenges for the future. The third is that we need to foster and support community leadership across the board. Um, we need to deepen our offerings, and for VCRD's part, we've been working on a plan to do so. We're working to build a community leadership guide for Vermont that will be online and on paper, that will describe ways that you can learn how to run a better meeting or raise funding, but also, how do you develop a sewer project? How, how do you develop a cooperative daycare center? How do you de develop a local ag network? And we've been working with communities all across the state that do all of those things. So let's add it up, let's put it together, let's make it practical and functional, and then let's list the towns that have done it. So you can call those folks, not reinvent the wheel, but be part of that bigger partnership of Vermont communities, because it's really about a fabric of progress, people working together. We're also going to, you put out the guide, you got to answer the phone calls, right? <laughs> so we're going to expand our capacity as a resource referral center. And we also want to, you know, we, we're constantly going to these communities and helping local heroes who are moving, and heroines, who are moving their communities forward. We need to do a better job providing coaching way beyond the number of, the core number of communities we can serve. Because lots of times local leaders don't need, you know, they don't need, uh, you know, a five-year program, what they need is someone to say, you're amazing, <laughs> it's awesome what you're doing, you can do it, you're going to be successful. You need help building a budget, you need help applying to be a nonprofit, we can help you with those details. But it's all about recognizing and supporting the talents and creativity of those people. So we're excited about doing that. And we're really proud to do it with so many partners, many of whom are part of the 
um, of the leadership fair up front here. So check out what they offer. There's a lot of great program offerings and all these folks are doing great work for the future of Vermont. For us, leadership is less an embodied power, privilege, or position. It's all about action. There's nothing wrong with doing things for your own benefit, but leadership is by definition dedicated to something greater, common benefit, mutuality, an ideal of freedom and justice, a driving unity, a collective priority. In this life, our challenges are what make our lives meaningful. And interesting, too. And they give us the opportunity to actualize the best of ourselves and the best of human nature in working with others for the common good. What an honor it is to be engaged in that mutual enterprise with you all today. So thank you all so much for coming. Now I get to talk about the purposes of the day. We've got sessions on leadership skills. We've got sessions that are vision sessions with moderators where really everyone's an equal and we want to hear your visions. We're going to capture those and, and record them and bring them back to everybody. Then there's places where we have projects that have been driven successfully forward that we want to learn from those key leaders. We're going to have an opportunity to do that. So your, the sessions you've signed up for are on your name badge. Um, if you want to get there early, some are overbooked. If you can't get a seat, go on to another session. Um, but, but let's be efficient about the day so we can move through everything. Please come back at the end of the day. Governor Scott is going to be with us to close the day. And we're going to have a big ice cream social with, we got tubs and tubs of Ben and Jerry's ice cream with, with some celebrity scoopers. And we've got to eat it all up because we can't take it, we can't leave it in the sun. Um, I want to just really quickly um, touch on our sponsors. You'll see there's a list of them in the back. Um, we deeply appreciate that our businesses in Vermont are on the line for this kind of work and are, have your back. They're supportive of, of, of local leadership throughout the state. And those include our Diamond Level sponsors, National Life Charitable Foundation and National Life Group. Our platinum sponsors, Northfield Savings Bank, Vermont Agency of Commerce and Community Development, the Wyndham Foundation, Front Porch Forum, Gold, Neil and Louise Tillotson Foundation, Velco, the Vermont Electric Power Company, Ben & Jerry's Foundation, Community National Bank, Vermont Innovation Commons, Vermont Works, and then Silver, Cabot Creamery, Key Bank of Vermont, Main Street Landing, Muscoma Bank, North Country Federal Credit Union, Stone Environmental, UBM Extension, Vermont Economic Development Authority, and then we have scholarship support from our good friends and partners at the Vermont Community Foundation. So thank you all so much. And then Ben and Jerry's in kind too, so don't forget about that at the end of the day. Um, also great to have WDEV Radio broadcasting live. We love those guys. Dave Graham and Bill Sayre are here today. Um, then we have Orca, Stephen Pike, Bob Farnham, and Rick McMahon all doing videography here, so we're delighted to have them. And it's my honor to introduce Jenna Koloski from VCRD's Community and Policy Manager. She's going to open a window that showcases some of the wonderful sparks of community leadership in Vermont today. So thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Paul, and thanks so much to all of you. So I'm Jenna Koloski, Community and Policy Manager with VCRD and I'll be hosting our Community Leadership Showcase. So I get the opportunity to introduce you to all of these wonderful leaders sitting up here. But I first actually wanted to quickly talk about all of you. Um, you'll remember that when you signed up for the day, and I just wanna make sure that this is working. Yes. When you signed up for the day, we asked you a series of questions to kind of capture a little bit of information about everyone that's attending today. And I wanted to share that with you quickly as a backdrop to our presentations this morning. Um, so we have attendees here from every single county in the state and it was really exciting to look at the registrants and see the kind of diversity of folks attending and the breadth of interest and things that you're involved in in your community. So we asked registrants, what issues are you working on in your community today? And up here is what we saw. So you'll see that actually building community and building a sense of community in our towns was really important, uh, as well as housing. Um, economic development, but also just bolstering civic engagement in communities. But you'll also see, I put this big long list at the bottom of the slide because 
there's actually, you're working on all kinds of different issues around the state. And when I look at that list, I see many of you that just identified challenges or opportunities in your community and just got to work working on them, on issues from uh, education to mental health to substance use, recreation, and a whole lot more. We also ask people, what do you need to better serve your communities? And I don't think you'll be very surprised by the responses. Uh, we saw training and support, volunteers, networking and connections to others that are working on these issues, facilitation support, vision, communications, time, and of course, financial resources at the very top. And then we also finally asked, what would you include in a vision statement about Vermont democracy? And these are the responses that we saw. So what you'll see is the responses are really overwhelmingly about engagement, about inclusiveness, about democracy that's really rooted in community and sense of place and an equitable and collaborative approach to progress and development. So you'll see that there are a few really clear themes here. You know, we're really here to celebrate individual leadership and people stepping up for their communities. But when you see these responses, you realize it's not just about us as individuals. It's really about building those connections and networking and building a sense of place and a sense of community. So we're here to celebrate individual leadership, but also to help to celebrate and to build those networks and that community uh, that we really need to do the work that we do. So all of this feedback that you provided is a really great backdrop for our community leadership showcase this morning. We brought these rock star leaders that are sitting up here together because we wanted to showcase all the different forms that leadership can take in a community. And we asked them to respond to a few questions. We asked them, what does leadership mean to you and what drives you to engage? Why or how is personal, individual, and community leadership important to the future of Vermont and to our communities? And are there ways that we can better support and engage others in leadership in Vermont? And we gave them the difficult task of answering those questions in five minutes. <laughs> and so we really appreciate them putting the hard work in uh, to share their stories with you this morning. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. So we're gonna kick things off with Ali Jang. Ali is a passionate and dedicated community leader. He works directly with families in Burlington, uh, especially those from different socioeconomic and cultural backgrounds. And he was elected to serve on Burlington City Council. And his work, both on the City Council and professional work, um, really gives a voice to immigrant families in Burlington and offers them confidence and opportunity to connect into their communities. Um, so I'll let Ali share your story. Thanks so much. Thank you very much for having me, and yes, I could not agree more with the senator um, that leadership comes with many different forms and sizes, but also different colors, and different accent too. You can say that I'm not from here, right? <laughs> so I came here in 2007, in, and I had no idea that I would come to the US one day. And as you can see, my wife, she works for the state, and she graduated from Middlebury, and then SIT, and then came to Mauritania as a Peace Corps. We got in love, and I came here. And when I came, you know, did not like it. <laughs> uh, no, because Vermont was so weird. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you don't know if it's a city, you don't know if it's a rural area. It was just messy. <laughs> and then we did camp, and I'm like, I'm done. But you know, I, I think now I fall in love with this great state because of these great people, because of all of you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, oh. How do we oh, go is from it going here? Backwards? Yeah. Right. Yes. <laughs> and to me, leadership is definitely like all of you. It's showing up in your local communities, in your schools in your rural areas, wherever people gather, you have to show up. Leadership, fundamental, is about showing up. Getting involved and having the ability to identify community gaps. Because most of the time, we all talk about the Z. They, they, they. But me, 
what is something affecting me? How can I identify and how can I collaborate with people to get it done? That's leadership and that's what we need to do to collaborate. No one can do it alone and nobody's coming. Nobody. It's us and we have to get it done by ourselves. As I said, let's keep everyone weird. <laughs> keep our values intact. We value community, we value hard work, we value support. If we leave those, we lost. Let's keep them intact. And also, leadership is not about developing your own, but making sure that you put the seed in others that never thought of themselves as leaders. Let's make sure that we support other people and build their leadership. I was the founder and manager of Burlington School District Parent University, which is an educational program for parents of students in the school district. Many people, when I first brought the idea, I received so many pushbacks, so many, for two, three years, until they accepted to buy it. You have to stay, keep what you believe in, and move forward. I see my assistant here, I'm Sydney, she's right here, and nobody believed in this. And now parent universities have over 70 community partners that work with us to empower parents as equal partners in their children's education. Thank you. Now I have gray hair, believe it or not. My little child just found a couple, and my wife said, oh, because it's politics. <laughs> when Obama started, no gray hair. Weinberger, no gray hair. But now we all building it. We have it all over. And I think in politics, it's all about being able to receive punches. Yeah, sometimes they punch you all the way to the ground. And sometimes it's not for you to punch back. It's about the fight for things that you believe in. And there is nothing other than fighting for children, for the future. The reason why I support the resolution that will be introduced tonight at the Burlington School District, at the Burlington City Council, around opposing the basing of the F-35. The scenario is not here. Please give me a round of applause if you feel it. <laughs> Representation, now. We cannot make decisions for people that we don't understand. We don't understand their values, what they value. We have to recreate the table in making sure we are inclusive. People's voices matter. And I'm glad that I'm the only black person from Africa who is representing over 4,000 people in Berlin. Thank you for voting for me, if you are here. Five minutes, I think I did it. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. So next we have Melinda White. Melinda is a recovery coach and medication assisted treatment care coordinator in Franklin County and is in long-term recovery herself. I saw Melinda speak uh, recently at a conference and I was just really struck by her passion for helping people in the community, uh, in, in fact, helping the most vulnerable people, and also struck by her strength and her honesty in sharing her story. So thank you for doing that. Thanks for being here today. Melinda. Good morning. So my name is Melinda White. First and foremost, I am a person in long-term recovery. What that means to me is that I haven't had to use a mood or a mind-altering substance since December 28, 2011. Thank you so much. And it, it would be easy to want to say, yeah, I worked hard and I earned it, but quite frankly, the only reason that I stand here alive today and able to continue with the work I do is from the people that helped me. Many of them leaders, many of them not really even recognized as leaders, but humble, strong, and to me, 
when I think about what makes a good leader, first off, I think about you know the word fearless, although to some degree, I was a little fearful coming and talking to people. I get that once in a while. Fearful about making change, but the fear that I think about that makes a good leader is somebody who, who recognizes it, but that doesn't stop them. And in a world right now that is broken with addiction, there's a lot of trails that need to be broken. We've started breaking trail in Vermont, which is so exciting, and I continue to travel and meet with other people from other states who love the hub and spoke model. Our recovery movement is beautiful, but there's so much more work to do, and it can be easy to say, well, we don't wanna try this because we don't really know if it's gonna work. Well, you know, we gotta try it because people are dying. And to me, that's what has given me strength to want to press forward is to remember why is it that we need to pull together and be strong and keep pushing? Because we're not trying to sell vacuum cleaners where I work. We're trying to save lives one at a time. We're trying to save families. So to me, pressing through, you know, courage is not the absence of fear, but it's pushing forward even when you feel fearful. So for me, a good leader is somebody who has a lot of courage. Another thing that I think of is a, to me, a beautiful leader is somebody who doesn't have that focus of wanting to be the best in the world, but wants to be the best for the world, who has a strength-based approach, who wants to love. And that was another thing when I was thinking about what's a good quality of a leader. The word love kept coming to me. And I don't mean love as in like that warm, fuzzy emotion we get for our loved ones and people we care about, but love is in that action. For the stranger that I don't know, but if I see them suffering, I stand over and I, I give them a hand. Love is buying lunch for somebody who is homeless on the corner and trying to set it down in a way that they won't even see where it came from. Love is paying it forward at get, Dunkin' Donuts getting coffee at restaurants. To me, that is a good leader. Somebody who is willing to make positive change, help and love others, but doesn't necessarily really want their face to be seen in all of it. Because at the end of the day, for me, it's not about me. There's a mission, I believe the only reason I'm alive after having gone through a number of residential programs, detox, I went to Philadelphia Teen Challenge. Um, don't let the name deceive you, it was actually an adult program. I went when I was 30 years old for 13 months to a residential program in Philadelphia. Um, and still needed another stay at a treatment center after that in 2011. But I guess the point that I get to is that you know, I'm going to try to get well and get, it, when I was in treatment, I never thought I was good. I didn't think I was gonna live to see 35, much less, I heard the comment about gray hair, well, I'm 40. <laughs> um, I didn't think I was gonna see that, and yet why is it? Well, it's because there's so many strong leaders that are examples to me, and again, I guess the biggest thing that I can say for a leader is lead by example. I don't encourage new people that are struggling with addiction to go to meetings and call a sponsor and get into a clinic, get a counselor, all these different things. I'm not gonna encourage them to do those things if those weren't things that I wasn't willing to do myself. And then to exercise, to eat right. I'm an ice cream fanatic. When I heard about the Ben and Jerry's, I was like, yeah, I'm in the right place today, baby. But you know, it's like, that being said, balance. If I really wanna try to encourage people new in recovery to, to grow, into strong leaders, I have to make sure that there's no blind spots and no matter where they see me, whether it's in a recovery room, whether it's at the grocery store, whether it's at the church I play at, whether it's at a ball game, I need to be an example and make sure that I never say or do anything that would take away from the credibility of being a person in recovery. So I think I got my five minutes. Thank you all so much for this blessed opportunity. So next we have Lucy Rogers. Uh, Lucy was elected to the Vermont House of Representatives shortly um, after graduating from UVM. Uh, she represents her hometown of Waterville and Cambridge and is actually the first woman to hold that seat since 1926. <laughs> We're so impressed by Lucy's dedication to her community and her drive to return to her hometown and take on a leadership role. So thanks so much for being here, Lucy. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, as Jenna said, my name is Lucy Rogers. I represent Waterville and Cambridge in the Vermont House of Representatives. Um, and I was elected this last November, which was six months after I graduated from the University of Vermont. 
Um, I want to focus on speaking about rural leadership and in particular speaking about young rural leadership. So I see leadership not as a goal. I think leadership is never the goal. The goal is to solve the problem and leadership is a means of solving the problem. Um, and for me, my interest in politics is something that's very recent. I never saw myself entering the political field, but what I did care about was my home community, the people I grew up with as neighbors, and having a sustainable rural town that was going to be um, thriving and growing into the future. And so I saw this growing up as kind of an issue for my little world of 700 people in my hometown of Waterville, which is shown up on the map. And what I realized both through the University of Vermont and through travel is that it's not an issue for my hometown of Waterville. Rural issues are an American issue, but they're also a global issue. Um, so I want to tell a short story that demonstrates that. I studied, I minored in Mandarin when I was at University of Vermont. So I spent a summer in China studying and traveling. And I met a friend who was a young person from a town of 200 people in rural China. Um, he invited me to visit his hometown when he went home later in the summer. And I recognized many things felt familiar, the farming community, I recognized many of the same crops. And we all went fishing on the weekend for fun in the local lake. But what struck me most of all was when I asked him if he planned to visit with the friends he grew up with when he was home for the weekend. And he said, no, they're all in the city. So I said, all of them? And he said, every single one out of all of the people he had gone to elementary school with, all of them under 30 had moved to the city. And I realized perhaps it was a more extreme situation than my hometown where in one generation, his town quite literally will not exist. But I recognized the stories he told me of his friends' stories as my own friends' stories, that as farming industries couldn't com compete with large-scale ag, there weren't new industries coming in to replace them. And as younger community members were leaving, there weren't newer community members coming in ready to take the, the reins and ready to be the new leaders for their towns. And I think seeing rural issues as a global issue made me see my place for getting involved because leadership is always local. And if each individual town can have leaders who are able to view a future for that town, where their communities can adapt to a changing world, where their communities can thrive in a changing world, that's how we can move forward in a global way. Um, I just wanted to showcase for a minute some of the young leadership we have here in Vermont. Um, this last session in the Vermont House, we had six members who were ages 25 and under. We had three men and three women. We had three men and three women. We have two Republicans, an independent, and three Democrats. We span the state geographically. We span the state, we span across the political spectrum, and we span across policy interest areas representing five committees with the six of us. Um, the one thing that all six of us have in common is that we all represent our home districts and we all represent rural districts. And so I think what this shows is that with the challenges we have for young people in rural areas, those who are choosing to stay are deeply invested in their communities, are invested in envisioning a new future for their communities, and are willing to think creatively and willing to think boldly about what that new future will hold. I think the greatest irony in thinking about the future of rural communities is that the very same forces of technology, of communication, of transportation that make it difficult to remain in a rural community are also the same forces that show a hopeful future for a rural community. As a young person, I no longer have to think that I'm making a choice between the rural community I love and staying connected to the world, between the rural community I love and being engaged in global issues. And I think in order to have this bold, creative thinking and this new vision, what we need to remember is that we can't fear giving up the past. And I think that this, this concern of losing what we love about the past of our community often prevents us from going forward. But what I would leave you with is the thought that we cannot hold on to what we love about the past unless we think boldly about the future. Thanks.
Casey. Next we have Monique Priestley. Uh, Monique is a real go-getter. Uh, she's the kind of person who sees a challenge or an opportunity and really goes for it. She returned to Bradford, Vermont from out west, and she's a dedicated volunteer and leader in her town, where she recently transformed an old five and dime to the space on Main. And I'll let her tell you all about that. Thanks, Monique. Hi, everybody. Um, this weekend, uh, oh, sorry. This weekend, I volunteered as a mentor for this incredible cultural entrepreneurship program that spends a week at Galusha Hill Farm in Topsom. It is hands down the most impressive program that I have ever seen in action. Uh, one of the most surprising aspects uh, is that among amazing individuals that are transforming their cities and towns, they all have some degree of imposter syndrome. I feel imposter syndrome deeply every day. I am someone who will show up, dive into the work, ask questions, and figure things out along the way. In many ways, I don't know what the hell I'm doing, but I love the challenge of figuring it out, especially when it impacts others. I feel failure when I don't anticipate every little thing. Some may just call that learning. I'm a learner that goes all in. In late 2016, our main street was suffering. One of our key businesses, a department store, had gone out of business. Across the street, a global oil company bought out a family business that spanned the block and said they'd keep everything the same, and left town as soon as the papers were signed. I was on 15 or so boards at the time, and every single meeting was discussing what we were going to do. My remote full-time job was in Seattle, and I was starting to view it as an escape route. I went, on, I went uh, to one of our business association socials. The depression was palpable. Previously, I had told a few close friends of an idea I had to create a multi-purpose space, most people smiled, but blew it off. I myself considered a retirement goal. A mentor of mine came up to me at the gathering and said, I think it's time to share your idea. There was instant buzz, more drinks were ordered, and we sat around talking excitedly. I went straight to my friend Sam's house. I didn't have any money, and I didn't have any idea how to pull this off. He said, you just helped me start a nonprofit. You know that's a possibility. I decided I would go the, uh, I decided I would see if there's any interest in a shared space, what people might pay, and what they might use it for. I left Sam's, sent out a survey, and Googled how to start a nonprofit. In 48 hours, I received 85 responses of people who had critical need for what I was suggesting. I met with each of them one by one, which led to further coffee dates and dinners uh, with their friends and family. By the time we opened our doors, I had talked to 300 or so people and based everything from furniture to floor plans on those conversations. I spent the first half of the year raising $100,000 in startup funds. I received a lot of help and an amazing board to advise me. I had people reviewing documents, listening to my pitch, making email introductions, donating money, giving advice. People like Paul Costello and Ted Brady opened doors and knocked down walls that I had been banging my head against for months. Uh, the Vermont Community Foundation, Jack and Dorothy Byrne, and building owners Vin and Angela Wendell, and many others made investments that made everything possible. I realized very quickly that every effort that I had ever volunteered for, every networking dinner I had ever gone to, and everyone in my circle had opened up an entire world in the state of Vermont that I hadn't dreamt was there. Uh, and more than anything, it made me feel incredibly proud to be a Vermonter, to live among strong people who can really pull together. We opened in mid-October as a community-based co-working maker, conference event, and gallery space. Our year-end goals were to have 25 monthly members and to serve 1,000 people. In 10 months, we were at 33 members and have served 5,000 people. We have hosted coworkers, kids yoga, renaissance workshops, business programming, meetups, a senate hearing, youth social justice dinners, and any number of other things. The space has taken directions uh, that I never would have expected. It has transformed lives. And the coolest thing about the space is that um, I get people from towns as well as all over Vermont, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts visiting, calling, emailing, figure out, figuring out how they can create a similar space, open a small business, or pursue any number of random life goals. They saw energy and it awakened something in them. Every one of our small towns needs that energy. They need someone taking charge and changing the status quo. Current leadership needs to mentor, listen to new ideas, and when the time comes, nudge people to step up. We need to invest in creativity, collaboration, and an atmosphere that encourages someone to take a chance. There are so many efforts that happen behind the scenes in small towns, and then if that energy and spirit dies, the Vermont we know will cease to exist. There's power in community, in small town grit, and in good old New Englander ingenuity. We have so much potential to do amazing things. 
Every single person in this room is a part of that. I know it doesn't always feel that way. It sometimes gets lonely to care, to show up, but hang in there. Even in those moments when you don't feel like you know what the hell you're doing. At some critical moment, all the dots will connect and all of your work will make sense. Your potential for impact is very real. Zach Freeman. Uh, Zach has a really incredible knack for bringing people together and realizing bold visions for what his community can become. He's a founding member, member of the nationally recognized trails organization RASTA, right here in Randolph, and he has logged countless hours at building a more vibrant community through recreation and events. Thank you, Zach. We need to raise this up a little bit. <laughs> Um, great, well thank you uh, Paul and Jenna and VCRD and VTC uh, for hosting this amazing day. I stand before you humbled by this opportunity to share the story about Rasta and creating a more vibrant community here in our hometown. I was born and raised right here in the Randolph area. Yep, I can turn on an accent to improve it. <laughs> My profound love for this community and deep roots in Vermont are at the core of who I am today. I was grateful, though, to have a long stint out west exploring, skiing, mountain biking, and traveling. And all of these experiences had a major impact on my life. I returned home, as many Vermonters do, to build their house, to raise a family, get married, and engage in my community. Vermont is like no other place, and my mom uh, describes it to a T. Vermont is like wrapping a warm blanket around you fresh out of the dryer and it truly is. Fast forward to 2014 when we, a passionate group of skiers, bikers, and outdoor recreationalists, imagined our rural communities with a more abundance of recreational opportunities. Out of that formed RASTA, the Rochester Randolph Area Sports Trails Alliance. We collectively advocate for human-powered recreation, sustainable trail building and use, economic development, and a strong uh, community value. Our vision is unique as one of our major projects with the U.S. Forest Service proved to be historic. The Breakthrough Backcountry Ski Project in Brandon Gap is in the Green Mountain National Forest and is the first time the U.S. Forest Service has ever approved a backcountry ski project like its kind. With fellow Rasta leader Angus McCusker, we work closely with the U.S. Forest Service to write the handbook on how a project like this would be designed and implemented and now is being used by other organizations around the nation. Building upon that success, we dug in deep and started to enhance our local trail networks while building a stronger outdoor culture in our backyard. The magnitude of these projects, combined with recent State of Vermont Vorac win, thank you Governor Scott, has cemented Rasta as a leader in the outdoor recreation world. After devoting countless volunteer hours with Rasta, I followed my heart, I dug in and created more and truly engaged in a higher level to give back to my community. Just over a year ago, I was grateful to carve out a new position, the Rasta Trails and Recreation Economic Director, or TRED. Creating more opportunity and vibrancy while enhancing our outdoor assets was the goal. A true dream job. This inspired me to launch events like the Braintree Bluegrass Brunch, the Braintree 357 Gravel Bike Race, and other small community-focused events that showcased Rasta's initiatives. At the same time last year, VCRD launched their community visit here in Randolph, which I fully engaged in, and that process helped shape this new chapter in my life. Today, myself, along with good friend and local vi visionary Paul Ray, <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> um, are renovating a historic 1850 timber frame building in downtown Randolph. It's right on Main Street. Um, in that space, we'll host a bike shop along with the much anticipated Rasta Outdoor Trail Hub. This trail hub will be the center for our trail information and then also a platform for statewide trail in it, info, Green Mountain Trail, Long Trail, um, and all of the other uh, clubs in the state through Vimba. Um, the renovation of this old building has truly lifted the community spirits and shined a light on where Randolph is going. 
Vision, commitment, and passion, and a true love of community is what truly drives me. I was raised to be open and accepting, gathering inspiration throughout my life, and to that I thank my parents who are here in the crowd today. My hope is that someday I too will inspire others to follow their passion and create their own future. In closing, I'd like to read a blessing that a dear friend and local leader, Morgan Easton, shared with me in a turbulent time between two leaders, trying to see eye to eye. It's entitled, For a Leader, by Irish author, poet, and philosopher John O'Donohue in his book, Bless the Space Between Us. This blessing speaks to the true essence of a leader and calls out that leadership is both a choice and a practice, a way of living, not a position or a title. For a Leader by John O'Donohue. May you have the grace and wisdom to act kindly, learning to distinguish between what is personal and what is not. May you be hospitable to criticism. May you never put yourself at the center of things. May you act not from arrogance, but out of service. May you work on yourself, building up and refining the ways of your mind. May those who work for you know you see and respect them. May you learn to cultivate the art of presence in order to engage with those who, who meet you. When someone fails or disappoints you, may the graciousness which, which you engage be their stairway to renewal and refinement. May you treasure the gifts of the mind through reading and creative thinking so that you can continue as a servant of the frontier where the new will draw its enrichment from the old, and may you never become a functionary. May you know the wisdom of deep listening, the healing of wholesome words, the encouragement of the appreciative gaze, the decorum of held dignity, and the springtime edge of a bleak question. May you have the mind that loves frontiers so that you can evoke the bright fields that lie beyond the view of the regular eye. May you have good friends to mirror your blind spots, and may leadership be a true adventure of growth. For that, thank you very much. of you for sharing your reflections. You know, at VCRD, we know that there are countless challenges that face all of your communities every day. So we think it's really critical to share these bright spots and these success stories. And what we get the opportunity to see in our work is that these stories really add up to a really wonderful narrative in Vermont of local democracy and of strength in our communities. And we also know these are some great examples of leadership, but we know that all of you contribute these stories and contribute to that collective narrative in our state. So we're honored to have you all here today. Please join me in thanking all of these great leaders one more time. And I'll pass it on to Paul and Ted for the uh, VCRD Leadership Awards. So quite <laughs> Doesn't it make you love Vermont more? Thank you. Let's have another round. So leaders galvanize others and catalyze projects. Ted, what are you doing here? <laughs> uh, in their communities, they change the state. They give power to progress. Uh, today, we're really excited to recognize two key leaders who each in their own way have exemplified this dedication to community and rural development. It's my pleasure to introduce Ted Brady, uh, Chair Emeritus from VCRD, uh, Deputy Secretary of the Agency of Commerce and Creative Dynamic Leader for Vermont today and the future uh, to help award the 2019 Community Leadership Award. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, I just want to take a moment here to reflect on the last hour of what you've just heard, because it is so uniquely Vermont. Start with Pat Moulton, who has had, I think, every leadership position in this state. <laughs> uh, not because she can't keep a job, but because everywhere she goes, uh, she does something amazing, 
And she does it in a different way than anywhere else in the state. You've never heard somebody say about Pat Moulton, boy, she's uncooperative. <laughs> boy, she has an ego. Uh, uh, it, it is the most incredible leadership style in the world. Then go to Senator Leahy. Uh, I want you to reflect upon being a 20-year-old kid, maybe a early 30-something, and deciding you'd like to be a United States Senator uh, when there wasn't an open Senate seat. You become an attorney, you become a prosecutor, you become state's attorney. You hire a 20-something-year-old campaign manager that has no campaign experience. He worked for a weekly newspaper in Essex, Paul Brune. We all know Paul Brune, right, from the Preservation Trust of Vermont. Yeah, let's hear it for Paul. <laughs> And you become uh, the first and only Democratic senator for the state of Vermont. Then I want you to look at this panel of five people. What you heard over and over again was, uh, nobody gave me this. Nobody said I should do this. Sure, there might be some nudges there, which is a really important part for everybody in this room to play. But they, uh, they, they had the confidence, they had the vision, and they just said, as Monique's shirt um, so Interestingly says, maybe I should get off the couch, right, honey? <laughs> also, a unique Vermont story. I don't know their backgrounds. I don't know the five of them all that well. But uh, they didn't pull in here with an entourage. They didn't pull in here with a well-moneyed past. They didn't pull in here as part of an elite group of people that have led this uh, community, these communities for their entire multi-generations. Reflect on that, because we hear all the time when you go into these communities in Vermont, the old boys club, the old boys network. Well, it's falling apart to our advantage. <laughs> so I have the great honor of actually doing what Paul told me to do instead of just talking, which is <laughs> to intro the community leadership Award. We're going to give two awards today, and the Vermont uh, Community Leadership Award is presented each year to celebrate a Vermonter who exemplifies dedication, integrity, and honorable service to community and to rural Vermont, and who has had a transformational effect on their community. Uh, we present the award to highlight the work of community heroes who epitomize the best of local community service. And here's a really key part of this award and they do it as volunteers. They get paid nothing to show up. <laughs> they get absolutely no free time to do this. They make that time. As Paul often quotes, you want something to get done, ask a busy person. Yes. These are busy people that have received this award. Uh, they're not paid employees, they're not elected officials, and their work has made their communities a better place. I met this year's recipient uh, for the first time on a community visit to the great town of Craftsbury. And this year's recipient is Emily McClure of Craftsbury. <laughs> Emily, for those of you that don't know this incredible story, has owned and operated the Craft Spray General Store since 2012 with their partner, Kit Basson. Did I pronounce Basim. it? Basim. I'm sorry, Kit. If you're here, I'm so sorry. <laughs> she grew up in Orleans, Vermont. And here's what I don't understand. She then went to Los Angeles <laughs> to be an event organizer. I have trouble seeing Los Angeles, but I trust it actually happened. Yes, Why would you lie? It's real. <laughs> she came back to Vermont uh, because of the sense of community in the Northeast Kingdom. And it's what also drives her career. You can see that in action everywhere she goes. Emily builds community through food and fun, along with positive energy and her can-do spirit. Emily's the vice chair of the Craftsbury Planning Commission. Do we have any planning commission members? Let's raise your hand. <laughs> Uh, and she's on the uh, board of the Center, uh, an Agricultural Economy Board, and has one of, uh, sorry, and one of the proud hosts of the annual Craft Spray Block Party. Anybody gone to the block party? <laughs> <laughs> Craft Spray takes the streets in a massive meal and party. You should check it out. She and her partner, Evan, have just recently had their daughter, 
and are enjoying the fun and new adventures of parenthood. Let's uh, turn it over to Paul, where the official award will be presented. Thanks, Dan. So basically, we got to lower that. <laughs> basically, <laughs> everywhere Emily goes, there's a party. Uh, she's a universal organizer. When we went to Craftsbury, one of the things that Jenna and I do is we call people 360 through the community. We say, who's a statesperson for the future of your community? Who's organized and will carry the ball? Who can be a spear point that isn't on the left or right and doesn't have a political ax to grind, but will bring people together, hold fort, and help people get things done? And of course, everyone pointed to Emily. Um, in that process, she brought 200 people together. They formed task forces on advancing land pro protection, improving cell service and broadband. Who would think that they would succeed? But they are. And then um, building a partnership between schools and the community. And meanwhile, the arts and a local daycare initiative sprung and grew uh, with this process. So she leads and builds social capital, um, but with food and fun and she binds her community together, and uh, we, we love that we're giving you the award this year. So thank you so much, and Ted and I can You know, I think the one thing that I take away from hearing all the speakers earlier today um, is that our small state thrives on our small communities, which thrives on volunteerism and local leadership, and that we all have to rally, and this room is full of people who are trying to bring our state to the next level. Um, and I'm so grateful to, to live here and to be sitting in that warm blanket <laughs> of Vermont. <laughs> Um, so thank you all for all you do, and you know, it's not convenient, and it's not easy, but it's necessary to make our state a better place and our local communities, and uh, go Vermont. <laughs> thank you. So, in addition to the Community Leadership Award, uh, we're going to today present our Lifetime Achievement Award from the Vermont Council on Rural Development. Uh, over the last few years, we've recognized a Vermonter who has dedicated their life and career to the community and to the communities throughout the state. The award is given in recognition of his or her transformational leadership and service to community and the people of Vermont. I think you'll recognize a few of our past award uh, winners, uh, including John Ewing, Rick Davis, Paul Bruin, and Molly and Hank Lambert. Any of them with us today? I haven't seen uh, Molly. She's everywhere, though, so she'll, she'll show up somewhere. <laughs> so this year, we're excited to recognize uh, somebody who has led uh, for many decades in their not only their position uh, where they serve, but also as just a mentor and leader to many people uh, in many different communities, and that's uh, Gus Selig. Just here for Gus. Uh, we're presenting this award to Gus today for his lifetime commitment and unconditional dedication to social justice, economic opportunity, land conservation, and housing for Vermonters. Uh, has anybody here not heard Gus speak before? Yeah, it's Gus, look around. There's one or two. So I'm just going to give you a preview. Uh, Gus talks frequently about the conspiracy of goodwill. Okay, I, I'll let him go deeper into that. But the little secret about the conspiracy, right? Those that create conspiracies should not be talking about them. That's like the whole idea of a conspiracy, right? You plant, you put people out there, and you never talk about it. Oh, I had no idea that thing existed. <laughs> Gus is the ringleader of a conspiracy of goodwill. Gus has created this 
through so many different projects, through so many different people, uh, it's an amazing thing. Since 1987, Gus has been the executive director of Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. Uh, under his leadership, they've invested more than $370 million uh, in funding to help develop or re rehabilitate 13,000 affordable homes, conserve 740 farms, comprising 167,000 acres. Give you an idea that's what, roughly half the size of the Green Mountain National Forest? Not bad, Gus. 267,600 acres of natural areas and recreational forest lands, and restored 71 historic community buildings. Now, believe it or not, Gus did not uh, start that job when he was three years old. He did have a career before the Housing and Conservation Board. Many people in this area know him as uh, the executive director of the uh, Central Vermont Community Action Council, a low-income advocacy and community development organization. He also uh, has served on the Affordable Housing Program Advisory Board for the Federal Home Loan Bank of Boston, and he's the past chair and the current board member of VEIC, the Vermont Energy Investment Corporation, the parent organization of Efficiency Vermont, and uh, vice chair of the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. I know, don't you like his resume? Uh, perhaps most notable, he is the town moderator for the town of Callis, and in 2010, he was presented with the Art Give Award for Smart Growth. Uh, he received his BA from the Goddard College and completed uh, the Harvard University program for senior senior executives in state and local government. Paul? Gus, come on up. That's a lot of history, Gus. A lot of accomplishment. William James called building a peaceful, humane, and fair community in the modern age the moral equivalent of war. And I know, and you know, and we all know, that for Gus, the war on poverty is never over. It's not something we are complacent about. In his way, Gus embodies for so many of us the best of our ideals as Vermonters. Conservation of the land married to strong town centers and housing with dignity for all members of our society. We're gonna hear from Gus about his sense of justice and all that, we always do. But it takes more than idealism to frame and lead VHCB. It's more than good spirit to convince governors of both parties, legislators, the feds, all of his partners to pour hundreds of millions of dollars through that entity to serve communities. It's been long, hard, consistent work requiring endurance, steel, and statespersonship. Gus is a collaborative engineer. He's a champion, a peerless champion of the people, buildings, and land of Vermont. Thank you, Gus, for all you've done. Do today, you're not done, but for the lifetime of achievement that you've already provided. Thank you. Ted, thank you so much. Um, this is a, a big day, um, not just because not because I'm getting this award, <laughs> but because you're all here and here committed to changing the future um, to make it better for all of us. Every day I've spent with the council and with Paul Costello has been a great day that's deeply moved me, enriched the work we do. So thank you to the council and for your great work. It's been just tremendous all over the state. Um, my family's here, and you all know that you don't get to do this work without uh, support from your family, so thank you, Marianne, and my daughter, Rachel, who's now a legal aid lawyer, just won her first Supreme Court case. Um, <laughs> she, 
individual recognition is really nice, but it's also really awkward because none of us do this work alone. Um, the ideas, programs, results that Paul and Ted have uh, spoken about are the hard-won effort of so many people putting their shoulders um, to the wheel of change. The work reflects creativity that doesn't necessarily emanate from me, sweat, lots of risk, dozens of partner organizations, their staff, their boards, supporters, and investors. Um, I can't talk about in the time that Paul has given me all the folks that have made a big difference. He's shaking his head. He's ready. He, he said one minute, and then he told me that I needed to talk about the moral arc of the universe, which I can't <laughs> do in a minute. So we're going to go just a little bit late. Um, and, and Ted made the same request a different day. Um, but I do want to just ask a few people, and I'll miss some folks, um, just to stand up who've been part of the conspiracy. There's probably five staff members from VHCB here. I see Avram Pat, who I started to work with in my community development days, Don Hooper, Mark Snelling. Um, and I want to say we've worked with every policymaker in the state of Vermont, from Governor Kunin. Mark helped us secure $20 million back then, and I saw Suzanne Young and Governor Scott has uh, provided us with a housing revenue bond that my great colleague Jen Holler and I worked so hard to secure. So all of you please stand up and let everybody say thank you for the work you've done as part of this conspiracy. <laughs> of good work. Um, both Paul and Ted, as I said, asked me to talk about the moral arc of the universe. When I got the, the, few, the sense of what this gathering would be, there's actually two speeches I've come across from when I was a kid in the 60s, and I was a kid then. Um, when I met Ted, and in fact, when I met the senator, we both had heads of hair, uh, so things were a little different. Um, the other speech is one that Bobby Kennedy gave when he went to South Africa in 1966 called the Ripples of Hope speech, and an implorement that young people needed to lead. Um, and it's beautiful, and I suggest it to you, but I won't quote from it today. Um, but talking about the moral arc is important because we are in such a dark time, and I know I don't want to depress anybody, but between family separation, children in cages, the most recent and continuing mass shootings, um, denial of scientific fact for short-term profit, growing income inequality, and when I started my work at Community Action, we did not have, because we did not need a system to serve the homeless, because basically in the late 70s, Vermonters were not homeless. We can get back to that. Defining people as other than us and demonizing them for their desire for freedom and a better life. And I say to you that 80 years ago this month, as a six-year-old, my mom arrived here from Hungary in 1939. Three months later, she probably and her family would not have gotten in at all, and I wouldn't be here today. So we need to think about that. This is not the first dark time in our history, so if you've been depressed by it, know that others have gotten through it, where anger, distortion, violence are so much upon us. And so each of us is challenged, and I think you're, everyone is here today, to be hopeful and to create hope and to create change for your colleagues, for your neighbors, for your families. And in doing that, you're defining our state motto of what freedom and unity truly means. Three quick thoughts so we can get back onto schedule. First, my mentor, the late Ben Collins, who'd been part of the Hoff administration, um, taught me that it didn't matter what law you passed, what program you developed, or even if you get the state to give you $300 million, that you'd have a lasting impact, unless you created a conspiracy of goodwill to go with it. And the cross-section of people who are here have the ability to do that. Second, to get to the moral arc, um, I found a sermon about 12 years ago um, that Dr. King gave at the National Cathedral just four days before his assassination. He was under great stress at that point in his career. He'd broken with Lyndon Johnson on the war in Vietnam. Lots of criticism of him. Uh, from some people that he moved too slow, nonviolence, was no longer in with some folks. Lots and lots of criticism. There are great meditations in that speech on poverty, on racism, on the war, on the need for human dignity and freedom. 
There's also a meditation on time. Dr. King was constantly asked to slow down, to be patient, to wait for change. From his point of view, to wait for the right to vote, to go to the bathroom, to eat at a lunch counter, to wait for freedom. He concluded the sermon by saying that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. But he also told us in that sermon, and this is where we all come in, and I quote, that human progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. It comes, he said, from the tireless efforts and the persistent work of people, of dedicated individuals, willing to be co-workers with God. And without that hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the forces of social stagnation. So we must help time and realize that the time to do right, right is always ripe. Last, and we'll get back on schedule, is the power to see not just what is today, and as you heard from the five people, but to think about and imagine something different, something better. Despite my roots, my family's roots in the Civil Rights Movement, and my dad took me on his shoulders to the first March on Washington, I can remember nothing except Mahalia Jackson singing. In 2007, most people I know from that era could not imagine that we could elect an African-American president. Early in 2008, in fact, it was Dr. King weekend birthday, um, my wife and I went to a movie at the Savoy. I can't remember the film. But on the ride home, we turned the radio on. It was American Roots. And the last song of the evening was Sam Cooke's A Change Is Gonna Come, recorded in 1962, 40-some years earlier. And from that cry, that wail, that demand for change, I thought for the first time that maybe this could be different, that, that America was ready for change. And I believe that we will again be ready for change. So in the days ahead, I'm pleased to be among all of you bending the moral arc, building goodwill, seeking justice, stirring ripples of hope. I thank you for this recognition, I thank the council, and I thank everyone here for the good work that you're gonna talk about doing today and that you'll be doing in the years ahead. Thanks so much. first community award we gave was to uh, Al Stevens. He, picked, he took the award and he said, I'll endeavor to earn it. Sat down. <laughs> <laughs> he did. He did. Thank you, Gus. So, now we're going to break. And I uh, want to just thank everyone from this morning.